Okay, I think we'll just get um, started. My name is Jamie um, Kerr. I'm a partner here at Burness Paul. And for those of you who don't know me, I deal with uh, immigration uh, law and have always dealt with immigration law, um, immigration, um, asylum, refugee, nationality um, law. And today's seminar um, or session is going to look at the, the new homes for Ukraine scheme that, that the government has, has just launched. This is a follow-up seminar to the seminar that we ran last week on um, Ukraine and the, the possible visa routes. And I know some of you will have been on that session where I looked at the government announcement, my section looked at the government announcement and then sketched out what we thought the scheme might look like and you now have the scheme. And the, I suppose the good news is it looks broadly the way we thought it might look. So everything that we that I had said last week in, in the first uh, webinar um, stands true. We don't have all the answers, as, as we'll see, to some of the challenges that I raised um, or potential challenges with, with the scheme, but we'll touch on them today. I've got some housekeeping to do. Uh, first of all, and it's just the basic, usual uh, things that I have to flag to you. Um, if everyone could stay muted, that would be um, great. Um, we have the chat function open, so feel free to post questions in the in, in the chat function. I'll try and keep an eye on that and, and answer the questions as we go. I don't mind taking questions as we go, or hopefully we'll have some time at the end. If there's any technical issues, then we'll just um, stop the, the webinar and, and and get in contact with you afterwards and then there will be a recording of the the webinar which will be sent out to everyone attending uh, and there's the privacy policy of the film on our on our website in case anyone's interested in that the the webinar that we've done last week um uh, i don't think is on the website but if anyone wasn't here would like to see that um then um just drop me an email or, or get in contact and, and let me know that that kind of three parts the first part was my colleague grace focusing on the family scheme for those with ukrainian family members then there was me speaking on this kind of corporate sponsorship scheme for want of a better phrase and, and then thirdly we had david morgan from our employment team speaking about what employers can do to help employees who might be impacted more broadly by the, by the issues that are going on so the Homes for Ukraine scheme, I've got some slides that I'll just work my way through. Um, the scheme is aimed at the people on this list. So individuals, families, uh, charities, community groups, and businesses. And the, the idea, the concept is that um, we will open our doors in order to um, provide accommodation to Ukrainian nationals who, are, who have left Ukraine or who are fleeing um, Ukraine. So this is different, um, it's a different visa scheme from the Ukrainian family scheme, um, which is aimed at those living in the UK already who have Ukrainian family members. So um, that started off very, fairly narrow, but as my colleague Grace covered off last week, on that, it's, it's now extended much more broadly in terms of which family members are covered by the by the scheme. This scheme is much broader. So, so this scheme, in theory, will, will cover um, those who do not have existing links to the UK, to Scotland, to, to the UK. And um, I think it's a really interesting model for the, for the reasons I outlined um, last week in, in that the model bypasses local authorities um, which creates a full bunch of challenges creates a full bunch of challenges for local authorities who will have to deal with um, education social work healthcare type uh, issues on, on the back of it but but the scheme bypasses local authorities and at the moment it's by administrations um, and it's bypassing the the, the mayors in, in England and it goes directly to 
in Civic Britain or, or Civic Scotland. And there's a real emphasis on charities, uh, community groups and faith groups um, picking up the, the scheme and essentially making it work. And again, that has challenges um, to it. When the scheme was announced this, this week on Monday afternoon, um, there was a website set up where people could register their interest. Um, ordinary people could register their, their interest to open their homes to um, someone from the Ukraine. And the first phase is focused on individuals and families and not necessarily on businesses and uh, corporates. I think that's going to be a later phase of the, of the scheme. And it covers Ukrainians who are resident in, the, and the Ukrainians and their immediate family members who were resident in Ukraine before the, the 1st of January. And that's, that's a technical thing, but that could impact some people who uh, saw what was coming. I've, I've certainly been watching the Ukraine for, for, for months now, and there will be a number of others who were watching this and, and perhaps left the country earlier. So they will be excluded by the by the scheme. I think in the grand scheme of things, that's not probably not necessarily going to be problematic, but it's worth uh, noting. And I think the expectation is that the people who have left before, um, or sorry, the people who have left, um, let me rephrase that. I think it's um, it's aimed at focusing on those who are Ukrainian and who have been in the Ukraine, as opposed to others in other parts of the, the world um, who, um, in maybe the government eyes, would, would use this as an opportunity to relocate when they might not necessarily need to. So I think that's why it's in there. So this is phase one of the, of the scheme, as I say, focused on individuals and families. The, um, concept has been helped along as it were by the government offering 350 pounds tax-free a month to um, anyone who takes someone into their house so that's 300, 350 pound regardless of whether you take one person or whether you take a family and the the government will pay that for up to 12 months so that's an additional incentive for people whether it's a necessary incentive or whether it attracts people who are who are focused on on, on the finances um, is, is probably a different matter for a different day and the, the sponsor the person opening the doors is expected to provide accommodation for at least six months um, but it, it can be longer than that and, and when you apply on the um, on, on the website or, or when you register your interest on the website, it asks um, what kind of time period would you be willing to, to sponsor someone for? This, this is also uh, um, a question that's not resolved in terms of well, what happens at the end of the six months. Can we, can we put them out of the house? And, and if we do decide to put them out of the house, or maybe we keep them for the full 12 months until the money stops and then say, okay, you have to move on. The question is, where do people then go after that if, if, if we've got really significant numbers coming in? My impression is that the government don't have a long-term plan on that yet. No doubt they'll be, be working on, on that at the moment. This is phase one. I should have said at the start, it's not my intention to um, go through the scheme and point out everything that's wrong with it. <laughs> and, and there's, there's a lot online, there's a lot of blogs, there's, there's a lot of lawyers already in that space saying it doesn't go far enough, it doesn't do this, that or the next thing. Um, but my focus today is really on um, looking at what we have and, and trying to figure out what we can work with in terms of what we have, knowing what the pitfalls are, as opposed to being critical of the, of the scheme. Because I think the scheme um, opens the UK to, to refugees or people from, the U from Ukraine. And um, we weren't in that position last week. Uh, the rest of Europe 
was, but, but we weren't. So, so this is real progress in terms of uh, where we were. Before I move on to go into the ins and outs of, of the scheme, I thought it would be um, useful, would be useful for me um, in, in terms of pitching the, the, the session uh, to do a little poll, um, if Emma's ready to do the poll for us. And the poll is just to see if there's anyone who's signed up or registered um, for the scheme. So the numbers are coming in just now. And I think that the numbers probably reflect where I thought there would be. There's about 13 percent people had already registered their interest on the on the website. 40% of people haven't, and 47% of people are, are, are thinking about it. Um, we, I, I signed up for the, for the scheme, um, primarily, I suppose, to see what the sign-up process would look like. Um, I don't particularly, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, I don't particularly want to go through the hassle of opening up the house to people I don't know who might not be able to speak English, but, but we've spoken about it. And, in the house with with the kids and we think it's the right thing to do but we are fortunate we've got a lot of space in the um in, in the house here so um so so we've signed up and, and i should say by signing up on the website it does not uh, tie you in to um to, to actually taking someone it's just an expression of of interest but this is what you would be signing up for so as an individual or as a family um, you will provide accommodation for at least six months um, and in return the government will give you, a, they call it a thank you, payment of £350 a month. Um, the catch, the biggest catch on the, on, on the scheme, and this is where the biggest problem with the scheme is, is that it opens on Friday and people in the Ukraine can apply for it but only if they have a named sponsor in the UK who will accommodate them. So um, this is where the government, some would say, have taken a step back. They say, well, there's a scheme, community groups, faith groups, and charities and universities um, with who will have existing networks across, the, the, across Europe um, can use that to match people to, to families. So this is where the real challenge is with the scheme. So I think the last numbers I saw said that there's around 100,000 people have registered their interest in, in from the UK side in um, opening their doors uh, to refugees. But the problem is out of that 100,000, I would expect, I would expect 90 to 95%, if not all of them, don't know a Ukrainian um, who we could sponsor. And, and the government at this stage are not doing the, the matchmaking for want of a better phrase. Um, and, and that's a problem. And I think that's where the government's guidance is very clear that they expect um, Civic Scotland or Civic Britain to, to step in and, and deal with that. Um, and I don't think that's going to happen quickly. And I think that's going to be the challenge with the, with the scheme. Um, and, and this is a wording from the guidance in terms of that matching. They say um, faith groups, charities and universities can use their existing networks to match individual sponsors to Ukrainians who need one. Um, so I, th I think the idea is if you, if you take a faith group, um, maybe a church here is linked to churches in Poland where many of the refugees are or in the Ukraine and they can use their internal network uh, to coordinate it, or, or maybe the same with the university who might be linked to universities in Poland, have to reach out. My understanding um, of it is that the, the government has not spoken to the universities, faith groups or charities about doing that. Um, and my understanding is that the first of all these groups of people who are expected to make the scheme work heard about it was when the guidance was uh, published, like the rest of us. So there's not really been any um, forward planning in, in that regard. But I know we have people from um, 
we've got a really diverse group of people on the call today, which is great to see. Um, but if, if you're in any of these organisations that does have European links, it could even be something like the Scouts, who, <laughs> who might be in an international network and, and, and are able to match, match people up. Um, and I think the process will be that the Ukrainians will fill out a, an application and put the details of their UK sponsor who they've been matched to or who they know. And the, the government will then do the checks, which we'll come to in a moment, on that UK family as and when required. Um, I think further down the line, the government might have to step in and take more control of it. I, I, I don't get the impression that they want to do that. Um, because they they have now set up a scheme and, and and they can say that we are a welcoming nation, that the scheme's there for, for people to do that and, and maybe not necessarily have to get bogged down in, in all the reasons why the scheme might not work. The, so the questions, questions are coming in, can charities et cetera, actually do the matchmaking? Uh, yes, they can. And, and I think what's going to hold up giving refuge is that all these groups mentioned, faith groups, charities, universities, um, will be waiting, as it were, to be told what to do. Um, and instead of seizing the initiative th themselves. Um, can sponsors choose who they want to accommodate? Yes and no. So if, if you sign up for the uh, government scheme, uh, I think at some stage, there will be some that will have to be used in some way or another. Um, but at this very early stage, um, the, the default position is that um, you can choose someone if you can find them, as it were. So if I've, I've registered the scheme and we said we'd take someone, we don't know any Ukrainians, but if I can track down a Ukrainian family who got kids around the same age, then they can make the application with my details and then they come in. So I would have a choice there. I think maybe later down the line, if the government get around to formalising it in, in some way, then there might be some randomised um, allocation process. But with the number of people signed up at the UK side, I think that becomes a massive task. But, but the immediate task uh, falls to um, Civic Scotland, Civic um, um, Britain. Um, the UK government plan to speak to any of the organisations that's now targeting as knowledgeable about the Ukraine. Well, you would hope so. Um, you would hope so. But my understanding is that it's not happening. And my understanding is that anyone that they have spoken to has been a tad disappointed by what they what they heard. Um, I want to get into the internet so you have spoken to about it, but I've not heard anyone come back and say this is great. Um, th this is a solution that we that we need. Um, has any funding been made available? No. There's a quick, quick answer. The only funding available is that financial incentive of, of three hundred and fifty pounds a month to to the families that, that take them in, and I don't think that um, income has any impact on people's uh, benefits as it were so if people are in receipt of public funds benefits then i don't think the 350 pounds um, impacts that um, but the the information provided is, is all a bit um, uh, sketchy uh, as it were so the, so the matchmaking is, is where there is a role to play just now there's a role to play for businesses as as well um, in terms of doing that matchmaking, if if you have connections, not just to Ukraine, but remember the refugees will be in, or the people fleeing will be in Poland, Romania, and other neighbouring countries. Um, someone's asking, is, is there any priority to groups such as um, dissidents, LGBTQ+, plus who might face significant difficulties if Russia takes control? Uh, no, there's, um, there's, there's no preference, as it were, at the at the moment um, there's no if, because the the numbers are uncapped the, the government have been very clear that um, Britain will take as many people as they can accommodate and how many they can accommodate will depend on 
how many people open their their doors, then it's then it's uncapped numbers. And and I think the reality of um, the not the reality of the question, but there'd be practical difficulties in that question as to as to who who they bring over um, and uh, who is viewed as 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 dissidents in the in, in the current context. But uh, it's an interesting question. But at the moment, no, and I don't see us going in that. Um, direction either at the moment it's focused on essentially everyone and and anyone which is actually interesting from a refugee law viewpoint because we move away from um offering protection to those who for one reason or, or another are specifically targeted to just offering protection to 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 anyone from there as it were um security checks um is, is a question that will dominate the um media coverage of this to say well who are we who are we getting over one and then secondly to say well who are we putting these vulnerable people with um, whose houses are they actually going into and the government say that they will do security checks on people um who are coming over um it's not clear what that will extend to whether it will just extend to um um, criminal, well, whether it would just extend to security checks in the way that we would think it would mean in, 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 in the sense that it's security um, as opposed to maybe low-level criminality. Um, so if someone has a, a conviction for, for shoplifting from eight years ago, are they going to be denied uh, entry? Um, the government have been quite clear that there are some elements um, that, that they are keeping tabs on more closely than than others, um, and the government have hinted that there's a risk that um, Russia will seek to send people over as well. I think for the vast majority of people um, who are opening their homes here, I don't think from the people I've spoken to that it's a major concern. I think the government saying that they will do some form of check um, is, is it seems to be enough. Um, I can't imagine the checks will be foolproof though, but part of the reason we've delayed in opening the scheme um, is because the government were concerned about the security implications in, in a way that the, the Europeans weren't. The, I think the, the Irish Taoiseach was asked that at the weekend on an, in an interview on, on a British channel, I can't remember which one, but I caught some of it. And they said, Ireland's opened the door, they're not worried about who's coming into the country. <laughs> and he said, well, Yes, I know there are some people that we're concerned about, but our primary focus is helping and providing refuge and everything else we'll sort out later on. Um, sponsors in the UK, so people like me are, and, and, and you, um, will be subject to suitability checks. And again, it's not quite clear what that means. I don't think there's going to be a rigorous regime in place, primarily because there's not time and there's not the bureaucracy. Um, in order to do that, and that will just slow it all down um, significantly. I think the um, a more rigorous regime may come in time, further down the line, and, and I think the regime aimed at businesses and organisations that want to take people as a collective, which we'll come to shortly, um, I think that might have a more rigorous regime than the rules for individuals. At the moment, the, the questions on the application are fairly straightforward. Uh, the website kept on crashing when I was trying to register on Monday, but it should really take you five minutes to, to register. And it simply asks, how many single rooms do you have spare? How many double rooms do you have spare? Um, are there steps to get into the property? That was basically it um, in, in terms of the suitability checks. I, I expect that there'll be some sort of criminal records um check um on british nationals looking to take people in but again i'm not quite clear how um robust they will be on that i can't imagine at an early stage that they will be too um robust and, and, and i think as long as there's not convictions um for anything serious it should be okay because i don't think the uk government will want to be in a position where Every day, the newspapers are reporting stories of people opening their homes 
but they were being turned down from doing so because of something, again, a low level conviction, for instance, that happened a number of years ago. But the safeguarding issues that I spoke about in the last seminar are still there in the terms of um, vulnerability, vulnerable people, potentially, if, if they're coming from the when we're coming from the east, they, they could they could have seen direct conflict. There could be trauma issues. A lot of the criticism around the scheme is well, we, we've opened our door in in our house. We don't know who we're getting, and we don't know what issues they they're bringing into the house, and and we don't have the capabilities or the training to to deal with it. I think all those criticisms are well intentioned, but but if we spend too much time focusing on them, then the scheme doesn't really get off the um, off off the ground. Um, in terms of the people coming here from the Ukraine, they're able to claim benefits and other public funds from the outset. That's a very, very significant uh, change um, to the, the previous um, approaches that we've taken to um, refugees, as it were, other than those who are brought through local authorities, um, the way we did in Kosovo in the 90 and the, the way we did in Syria and the way we've been speaking about doing in Afghanistan for a year and not quite got around to doing yet. Um, they're, ac they're, they're permitted access to healthcare, they can use GP surgeries, NHS, um, and they're permitted access to schools in terms of education. I think the local authorities are going to have a really tough job in planning this because it's not being coordinated. Um, and when we sat down with the kids, we done a list of pros and cons. And, and one, of the, one of the things that the kids put on the pros, or the positive side was that they can show their school to, to a family who come in. But I suspect the school will get a shock if, if a chunk of our families at Curfin organise and the, the school get notified that there's another 20 kids coming to the school that don't speak English. And obviously schools have had that issue previously when dispersal of asylum seekers started, the schools adapted. If you take schools in maybe some of the central belt, um, they are perhaps better equipped to, to deal with that in terms of uh, language um, issues, first and foremost, um, and uh, intensive involvement from the various support agencies and the like. You, if, if the numbers are going to go through this, the, the government um, expect, then, then there are real challenges there. And you even take the challenges for a GP surgery, maybe in a more rural part of the um, of, of the country, if a community group or a faith group are organising and bringing lots of um, people there, there might not be resources. So, so there's all sorts of challenges around that. Um, they have the unrestricted right to work in the UK. Um, and that's a, that's a good thing. Um, and that's a really significant change because uh, refugees tend not to have the right to work. And it's a bone of contention. I think for the business community, um, this is something that is in the short term, it might not be the solution to all the challenges that we are facing in terms of finding talent, skills, or even labor, because we need to bear in mind the, um, that martial law still exists in Ukraine and the males of fighting age, essentially adult males were not allowed to leave the country and it came a point where they, where they couldn't leave the country. So we're not necessarily going to be getting lots of able-bodied um, people coming over who, who can take up all the, all the jobs that we need to fill. Um, and and I, I think it's likely to be maybe older people, kids, and, and maybe their, their mothers. Of course, the women can do those jobs, obviously, but um, if you've got caring responsibilities, you might still have a partner actively fighting in a war zone. The idea of going out to uh, pick pick strawberries or, or or work in hospitality or take up one of the uh, digital skills jobs that, 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 that we have a real shortage of um, is maybe easier said than done. I think longer term, this is a potentially a, a good solution to the, the population demographic challenges that, that, that we talk about. Um, and, and there can be benefits in the long term, but I don't think it's a short term answer. Lots of, we'll, we'll touch on this slightly later on, but in terms of businesses, there's a lot of questions that we have been asked from clients to say, well, how do we offer jobs to two people? Um, 
I think that'll come later. So I think the focus is how do we help people get here first of all, and then when they're here, um, how do we um, how do we help them find work, essentially. Um, but but I'll touch on that later on. And then the no impact on benefits I've already mentioned in terms of the three hundred and fifty um, pounds from from the government. We have a um, question here saying should the war expanded to more countries will the scheme expand with it? Um, it wouldn't surprise me if the board does expand. I, I don't think that this is a short term issue that's going to go away. Um, will the scheme expand with it? Well, I think it's hard for the reasons they're opening to the Ukraine, it's very hard not to open elsewhere. But on the other hand, um, we didn't do anything for Syria. We didn't do anything for, for Libya. Um, and then when I've said that in, in the office, some, someone said to me, yeah, but the Ukraine's, Ukraine's uh, on our doorstep. It's, it's closer. Um, but when you look at a map, uh, Libya is actually much closer west, it's more, more western in, in geography than, uh, than Ukraine. And if you look at the distance between, say, Glasgow and Kiev and Glasgow and Tripoli and, and, and Libya, there's only about 200 miles um, in it. But, um, but what I, why I say that is that the, the government have taken a radically different approach to the Ukraine or to Ukraine as they have from Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Sudan, or any other conflict zone that, that, that we see refugees coming to the, to the UK from. Um, and that's not to say that this one size fits all will expand because I think the government will be concerned about numbers, even though they say it's uncapped, it goes against everything the, the governments have been uh, saying over the entire time I've been practicing in immigration law. And that's been regardless of the color of the, of the government, uh, as it were. Um, I think the longer it goes on and the more people that are coming, the more barriers we will see going go in the way of the of the scheme to limit uh, numbers. Uh, one of the other questions um, is the government looking for accommodation from charities, etc., as holding whilst the match price, matchmaking process takes place? No, I think is the is the answer. The government have essentially set up the scheme and left everyone to their own devices. I think further down the line, um, the government might um, look for accommodation. I think local authorities will potentially be looking for accommodation. Um, local authorities will be planning, will have all sorts of challenges to plan for, and, and accommodation might be uh, one of them. So, um, But I think central government, I don't think, are looking for accommodation because <clears throat> I mean, they have solved the accommodation problem by opening a scheme and asking us to provide the accommodation. Um, so authority, local authorities have been really bypassed, um, which, which, is, um, which will be challenging in, in, in lots of ways. Usually the quickest and most efficient ways to work with local authorities. And I'll also mention the devolved governments. I think Scotland offered to be a super sponsor and, and take 3,000, I think it was, families. And, and Wales offered to, to take a chunk of families, but the, I don't think the UK government have taken them up on that offer yet, and the government are pref preferring the numbers to come through um, here, and the, the numbers will be low in this phase for individuals and families because we don't know Ukrainians. I think the, one of the opposition spokespeople on Monday said that the scheme is ludicrous because it's expecting people in the Ukraine to take to Facebook or Instagram to promote themselves and hope that someone in the UK would, would find them. It kind of, kind of, in a way, sums up the, what, the way the scheme has been um, designed and, and, and designed deliberately. Um, the, there will be later phases for uh, businesses, and, and that's where the accommodation question will come in as well. So at this moment, it's individuals, families, having to identify people. It says that the second phase will be the, the corporate aspect where businesses can um, accommodate people. And, and again, it's not clear. We covered, in the last webinar, I covered off lots of questions about how that would work. But I think 
where it's going <clears throat> is that a business like ours, like Burness Paul would say, um, okay, we will take 10 families and we will figure out ourselves how to support them and and accommodate them. So I think that's where it's it's going to. Um, it's it's a model that you would maybe expect um, faith groups, I suppose. I keep coming back to faith groups because they play such a central role in terms of government's guidance um, and how this would work. But you can imagine a church or a, or, or, or a religious group saying, OK, there's enough goodwill here. We'll, we'll take people, we'll sort it out amongst ourselves where, where they go. I think that model is going to be applied to businesses first and foremost. And again, like I covered off last time, that creates all sorts of challenges around, well, if, if I take someone that Burness Paul has sponsored, then who's responsible for them? What happens if I leave the company um, to have to hand them back to the, to the company? What happens if there's a problem? in the house or there's a disagreement or something happens, is that then a disciplinary offence that I might get sacked for? So there's a million questions and, and I, can't, I don't expect that we'll get answers to much of that if that phase comes out. I think that phase will not be out anytime soon. I think there'll be a major focus on this individual aspect. Um, and um, businesses, organisations, the, the, the question at this stage will be, or, or should be from a, a CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, viewpoint um how do you help by encouraging staff um to register for the for, for the scheme um or how can you help in terms of matching um staff so so we are in the lex mundi network a network of all the big uh, law firms across the, the world that, that there is a firm in um ukraine we've been keeping in contact with them as as have the network um so it could be the one thing our firm could do is to, to speak to that firm and say, do you have any staff who would want to come here and we could link them up? So that's the kind of role business can play at the moment, just, just now. And, um, as, and, and then we'll move on to the questions that, that lots of uh, clients are asking me around, around um, such as how can we support with employment and how can we, how can we help? And, and I think that becomes secondary um, um, to, to, to getting people here. Um, First of all, but but there are challenges around that that I don't think we all necessarily have our eyes open to at the at the moment. And then a, a question for employers, businesses is well, what support will we give to staff who do register? So um, if I register and bring a family into the into the house, am I going to have to take a day annual leave from the day they arrive, or or what what leeway can can you give to help to help staff? I think the really encouraging thing is that um, there's been a radically different approach to, the, to this refugee crisis than any, any other one. And, and it's the first time I've, I, I've dealt with refugee issues since I was a trainee solicitor doing high volume legal aid work. And, and it's been a far cry from what I've done in recent years and, and working with, with many of you. Um, but it's the first refugee crisis where the business community are fully on board in terms of helping. And, and if I look at my own um, business here, we've donated money to charities on uh, in, in the Ukraine. We've organized collections. As a business, we've tried to be very um, hands-on and helping um, as much as we can. And, and there are discussions about what more we, we can do. And it's interesting, I, I talk about CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Um, I don't get the impression that our clients, that, that, that you guys or anyone else I speak to, is doing it just to, sit, to, just to be able to tick a box. I think there's a genuine um, uh, openness and desire to, to want to do something that pra helps in a practical way, and, and that's, that's great to see. So I think on, the, on, on, on this stage, the focus is perhaps on um, something as simple as, as putting the link into the, the, the office newsletter to say, here's the scheme, are you opening it? And then at board level, having the discussions about what support and whether if the second phase comes, which I think if it does come, we'll be much further away, what would we as a business do and, and how would that, that work? But at the moment, it's about coordinating of um, coordinating your employees to register um, 
but also supporting civic society effort. So th th there'll be a, a massive gap between um, the, the businesses who, who have got the funds to help and, and the desire to help, and then the, those faith groups, charities, community groups, who have perhaps got the, the networks, but not necessarily the resources to, to help um, in, in, in one way or another. And, and even when I say about resources, it could be simple things that people are going to have to get to the UK, so they're going to have to pay for flights here. So who's paying for who's paying for that? The refugee themselves. So I can match their family and say, well, bring them here. But then it becomes a different equation when they say, oh, we don't have enough money for flights. Can you maybe help out? So there is a bit of matchmaking within our business and civic community um, here to um, where, where there's a lot that, that can be done. Let me just look at the questions. If there's any more questions, please feel free to, um, to fire them into the, the box. Um, any idea how we get around the issue of disclosure checks and qualifications required to do certain jobs? Um, not yet, but there's been quite a lot of rel relaxations in terms of rules. So um, the English language criteria are, is, is being relaxed for sponsored roles. So that's a really significant change. Um, Ukrainians coming to the UK, I, I said the other week, would usually have to um, be tested for TB, tuberculosis, before they come. Um, but that's been halted. If it's roles in the UK that require disclosure um, checks, I'd be surprised if they were halted just for um, Ukrainian nationals. So I think they would still have to go through the process here. Um, the, 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 I suppose Disclosure Scotland or DBS and and is it DBS in England? I think they're called. Um, they might have some sort of process that, that simplified or, or they might have a different approach um, to it if they can't get the information from the places that they that they usually would. But I don't see them dispensing with the checks um, from a UK side. Um, what happens if there's a breakdown in situation with sponsors in the Ukrainian? How is that mediated and handled up to the local authority? I don't know. And, and I think neither do they. And, and, and I think that's that's going to be challenging um, bo both ways, as it were. Um, that could be challenging in, in, in both ways. But there is no mediation process. There's no, there's no process for matching people. Or one of the, if, if I think of our pros and cons the list that we've done, one of the things on the list that uh, my little girl put on is, is to say, they might not like dogs. We've got, we've got dogs, we've got puppies. Um, but there's there could be a million reasons why the relationship would break down. But I don't think it's necessarily for the local authority to step in because the local authorities have been sidelined on this um, completely. Um, so I, I think that's a challenge, and that's potentially a challenge for matchmakers. So if if you're a community group or a church group or in a network, a university network, and and you match someone to me. If I then come back to you next month and say this is dreadful, these are not, this isn't what I thought we were getting into. Um, I don't think you're under any obligation to kind of take them back, um, as it were. But 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 there could be all sorts of challenges around that reputational issues. But again, these questions, there's lots of questions. There's very few answers um, around. Um, Why nothing this week from the Home Office? Is the new scheme all down to Gove and his uh, levelers unit? Yeah, so I think um, Gove and his levelling, levelling up unit are dealing with it um, personally. It's interesting it's not quite Home Office um, that are dealing with it. This, this scheme um, will, I suspect, be causing Home Office officials nightmares because it, it goes against everything that they've ever done in immigration and, and, and probably draws back on everything they've been trying to do over my entire 15 odd years in, in, in the field. But um, but this is Gove uh, and, and obviously with um, Mr Gove, he, he, say what you like about him, he's, he, he's a very good politician. Um, and the, the challenge on this is to figure out, 
and he's very competent as well, which is um, a bonus, I suppose, um, in terms of setting up the scheme. But but then it becomes hard to figure out well, um, what simply politics and politicians play politics and, and what's real. And, and that's a challenge about the scheme. So we've got a great looking scheme that opens the doors to unlimited numbers. So the headlines are all there. It's, it's, it's a good message. But then in practical terms, what numbers are going to actually come through it? Well, the government's handed that over to us as, as, it, as it were. And, and we're all standing, not really knowing what to do because <laughs> we're used to uh, someone telling us what what to do and and I think if, if the government were clear and said here's what we want <clears throat> the business community to do here's what we want faith groups to do <clears throat> I think everyone would um, would take up the challenge and, and get on with it but, but the problem is that the guidelines are there no one quite understands them and, and there's a real gap as to how we move uh, forward the question here from someone saying would it be seen as exploitation if you're looking for a host match that you could also offer jobs to and that they were qualified for, or a job offer with the going rate of pay, would it be okay? Um, and this is where the real challenging questions that I covered last time on vulnerability come in. So um, there are various sectors that on the back of Brexit and coronavirus have been struggling to attract staff. And, and even if we think of hospitality um, sector, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, well, we would quite, we'd be quite keen to match up with someone with an interest in aeronautical engineering because that's where I work and, and that's where we have jobs available. Um, I think if, if we're looking at lower skilled uh, jobs or unskilled jobs, we get into quite a difficult area if accommodations tied to work. Um, and again, I, I come back to the earlier point that, that the kind of people that we would want for some of these roles will potentially not be coming at this stage and might not be coming for for quite some time. Um, is it exploitative? Um, I don't think it, it would be exploitative, but I think the risk is that it's seen as exploitative um, at a later stage. So, so maybe the, the concept that we maybe understand quite easy is someone says, well, I have a hotel with 100 rooms. I need staff. So anyone who wants to work in a hotel can have a room. Um, and um, that that messaging would just have to be quite cautious. I don't think that's necessarily exploitative. I think from the employer's viewpoint, they're offering the best of both worlds in a way. And saying, well, one, I can offer accommodation and a job. Um, but then the question is, well, are the two things tied together? If that person then moves on to another job, do they lose their accommodation with you? Um, Scotland becoming a super sponsor, what does this mean? Um, Scotland and Wales, I don't know about Northern Ireland, have, have offered to become a super sponsor. Um, but that's simply going back to the older models of Kosovo and Syria, where the Scottish government working with COSLA and the local community, uh, the local authorities say, we will take 3,000 families, so just allocate 3,000 people or 3,000 families to Scotland. And then... Um, the, the, the Dewall government, Scottish government will work with the local authorities and say, OK, we're sending 200 to Glasgow, 200 to Falkirk, 100 to Argyll and Butte, 100 to Shetland. And, and they would then disperse them, as, as the phrase, um, centrally. So that's what being a super sponsor is. I, I don't understand why the UK government, or I do understand why, the UK government are holding off on the back of that, because if, if they agree to the, to the Scottish government's proposal and the Welsh government's proposal to take a couple of thousand each, then those governments are expecting the UK government to find those 3,000 people. And the UK government at the moment seem to be being very hands-off in um, the hands-off in anything hands-on in relation to refugees in Poland or Romania or even in Ukraine itself. So I, I think the barrier to, um, to the Home Office saying, well, here's 3,000 people you can take and, and leaving it to the Scottish government to then sort it out, um, is that the UK government do not want to be um, rounding refugees up, for want of a better phrase. They don't want to be identifying people. And, <clears throat> and, and, and that's a problem with the full scheme at this stage, where they've, they've identified 100,000 people um, in the UK 
who will take uh, a person into their house like us. Um, and everyone, I think not everyone, but a chunk of people who have signed up for the scheme will, are expecting that they will get allocated someone. So we're all waiting to, okay, we're going to get allocated a family, but, <clears throat> but the UK government has done nothing on the other side to, to find those people. And, and that's why it's been left to church networks, university networks, any other uh, networks out there. Um, someone's asking about self-contained units, flats available in temporary tenancies, any mention of that accommodating within existing households. Every, not everything's focused on accommodating within existing households. So um, people are offering holiday homes or second homes or empty flats that they have. Um, there's been no mention on tenancies, no mention on residency rights, occupation rights. Um, there's a housing law aspect. I don't know very much about housing law, um, but there's there's a challenge around there as we kind of the what rights. If you're a tenant in someone's house, then you have all sorts of uh, rights. There's a process for eviction and the like. If you're living in someone's house in terms of this scheme, then there's probably very little rights that, that you have. But it's it's not focused just on existing houses. It, it can cover um, people with um, spare accommodation anywhere. Um, where will we be able to find a recording? Um, the recording will be sent out after the, the session. I think it goes to the tech people and they tidy it up a bit and then it will come out to you all. I think someone's answered that. Um, met, uh, have you mentioned the Sanctuary Foundation uh, already? Uh, no, unfortunately I haven't. Um, and I think I'm right in saying feel free to come in um, if you're involved with them. But, I think that's a foundation that's already doing matchmaking. Um, it's already doing the matchmaking process. The, the government guidance um, basically said that if you're registered for the scheme, but you don't know any Ukrainians, then go to your local faith group, community group or charity to see if, or university to see if they can use the network. But yeah, I think that's a fair point. There, there are already existing groups in the third sector um, who are uh, ahead of the game on this and are, are able to uh, match people uh, up already. And, and, and I think, if I'm thinking of the, of the, of the same people, the Sanctuary Foundation is, is one of them. So I think that's all the questions I had in the um, in the chat yeah sanctuary, sanctuary foundation run bbc breakfast over the weekend so they are the people that i'm uh, that, that i'm thinking of who are matchmaking i <clears throat> i think one of the challenges for particularly for the third sector is that there's going to be a lot of goodwill on the british side in terms of charities coordinating stuff um with some exceptions i'm not really sure that all those um charities have got the uh, networks or connections to be able to, um, to to coordinate this in a way that's going to be effective. Um, and, and, and I think that's why the government are focused um, on um, the, the bigger organisations who may be trans-European and, and have structures and, and are able to, to organise. Um, can you register your business to phase two of the scheme from Friday? You can register your business to phase, you can register your business now. So on the website, um, you can either register as an individual or register as a business. The questions are fairly similar. If you're, I know a chunk of people, close to 50% of you said that you were thinking about the scheme, it's worth probably registering just to have a look um, or just to be kept up to date with the, the updates from the, from the state, from the government um on the scheme um and registering i think i said earlier doesn't oblige you to take someone um but i suppose what we don't want to do is everyone register and, and then the, if the scheme were going to work efficiently they'd, they'd find the numbers and then everyone backs out when when they're faced with the choice it's not an easy choice um it's not an easy thing to be asked to to do and there's going to be all sorts of challenges with it, but but I, I said I said in my first seminar that I'm at home here in Carfin uh, or Carfin Grotto up the road, 
there's a there is the monument to you to that's about 50 years old to Ukrainians who came to Scotland in the 40s and in, in 50s. Um, and they've carved and they've integrated um, and, and they've they've contributed. And essentially we have been asked to do the same for the same country uh, now as 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 we've done in the um in, in the 40s and, and we're in a very different um world now from, from where we are then. Um, someone said Sanctuary Foundation are hosting a seminar on Zoom this evening. Um, so the details are there for the for the website. So anyone who's interested in go on that. From a legal viewpoint, we are um we're watching this very closely. Uh, we're speaking to lots of different people on it just to keep up to date. Um, primarily because this is my field. This is what I've always we deal with refugees and always, always have dealt with them. Um, and um, if there's anything we can do to help, whether you're clients or not, please do just reach out to, to me or, or my colleague Grace or, or anyone else in the, in, in the team. If you've got ideas, then feel free to, to drop us drop us a line, um, drop us a, an email, or if there's anything here that you want to explore more, then again, just just let us know. And, and, and I said earlier, you don't need to be clients of, of the firm to be on the webinar or, or, or to be here. Any significant uh, changes or anything else that happens, we'll do another follow-up um, webinar. We don't want to get into the habit of doing death by webinars, but, but our first one, set out what we thought the scheme would look like um, in, in this regard. Um, now the, the scheme's actually out and, and we know what it looks like. It does look like the way we guessed it would um, look. And if there's any other significant changes or, or if it opens up, um, then we'll do another update. So I'm out of time, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever way you, you view it. Uh, we're here to help, we're happy to help. I think there's a big task ahead of us the scheme opens on uh, on Friday um, for applications, so people can start applying from Friday. The numbers are going to be so low because although there's lots of people signed up to open their homes, uh, there's no links to Ukrainians who they can give that information to. So the numbers coming through will be much smaller than they could be. And I think all of us here have got a role to, to play either as individuals or as uh, organizations to help push out the the message that the scheme is is open so hopefully you enjoyed the session and if there's anything else we could do then just let me know